Welcome to another episode of Fake True Stories, our newest podcast where we look at the true history behind movies that claim to be based in historical fact. I'm Connor Izagari. And I'm Isabel Gonzalez. And today we're discussing the wildly historically inaccurate but still somewhat beloved Disney classic Pocahontas. It'll be rare that an animated film appears on the show, as most mainstream animated films are aimed at kids and don't mine from world history. Pocahontas is one that does. Uh, yeah, I know you're a big fan of this movie. It's a beautiful movie. I love it. It's not accurate, so I'm already going to say fake right now. Just fake. We spoiled it. You don't have to listen to the end. Um, but I love this movie. It's nostalgia, really. I understand why people don't like it, but the nostalgia is such a beautiful film. Also, Mel Gibson, I like his voice. It is visually stunning. Like The work they put into this is is admirable, you can tell. I just wish they put that kind of effort into the script a little bit more. Well, I think it was Oscar bait. Like I had read something or watched a podcast. I think it was Shea Frillis Productions. He does like video essays on YouTube. Um, and he did like where he ranked every single Disney animation film ever. Like he ranked all of them. And he put Pocahontas really far at the bottom because of like one, the inaccuracy, but he also said it was Oscar bait and it didn't even win an Oscar, I think. Um it won yeah. too, but we'll talk about that. Oh, it did. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but it was Oscar bait. So they were trying to follow up like Beauty and the Beast. And they were like, we can make like another beautiful story. But for some reason, we're not going to come up with the like our own thing. We're just going to butcher this actual historic event. Yeah. We're going to talk all about the thought process behind that and the production. And it's actually quite insulting how they were just like, well, we'll just take this and shove it into the Pocahontas story. And there you got a movie. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Uh, this week, it was my pick. And I chose Pocahontas because it basically convinced an entire generation of Disney kids that Pocahontas and John Smith were in a consensual relationship <laughs> and the settling of the new world was at least somewhat reasonable. So, uh, no to both of those right off the bat. Uh, frankly, I think it's misguided to mix real history with fantastical elements in a film aimed at children. Uh, this came out in between The Lion King and The Hunchback of Notre Dame, both of which are obviously not true stories. But Pocahontas is the only time that Disney attempted to adapt a true story to their animated canon. And I don't think they should have done that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, especially because, you know, Hunchback, at least it's based off of like a real book, even though it's also like we could do a whole separate podcast about, oh, this isn't like the book at all. But I'm not going to read that many books. So that's not going to happen. Uh, I... You have to get somebody else. But <laughs> I had an idea for a podcast kind of like that. But I came to that same conclusion. Like, that's too, that's too many books. No one's going to want to do that. No, I wouldn't. Because, like, I mean, freaking um, Lion King is Hamlet, right? Is that what it's based off of? Yeah. Or Macbeth? Yeah, Hamlet. Um, and, like, that's not accurate, like, to the story of Hamlet, of course. I mean, besides the fact that they're lions. And then Hunchback, like, that is way too happy of a movie for the actual Victor Hugo novel. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, Pocahontas is too happy of a movie for what actually happened. But, like... There, I learned a lot whenever I was actually going through this um, because, you know, you always hear that the movie isn't true and you always hear all these things about it where they're like, oh, Pocahontas was actually, you know, all these things. And they make it sound so awful. But like a lot of stuff I read, it wasn't actually that bad. Like, I don't know. We'll talk about it. Like it wasn't as like dramatic. And, uh, it's, but the movie's still fake and not <laughs> accurate. <laughs> well, and also with, you know, Lion King and Hunchback, it's adapt. It's, a, it's adopting, not adapting, uh, you know, fiction i mean if quasimodo existed and there was an incident with a gypsy woman in you know france then i'd have more problems with hunchback it's true yeah. that's true maybe there was maybe hugo was inspired by something that would be wild you just stumbled onto a hunchback he's like let me tell you my story Vic. <laughs> like, oh. okay speaking of hugo this is just real quick um la mis it's based in the french revolution would we consider that a historic thing Ah, uh, I don't know. I, was, was Jean Valjean a real person? Like, did that happen? I'm going to say actually probably not. Pro I, don't I don't know. That feels more like an Oscar Sunday because it was up for like 12 Oscars. Uh, but maybe. I mean, we we maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I also do. I want to watch two and a half hours of Les Mis. Yes, you again? absolutely do. Russell Crowe's <laughs> singing voice as Javert. Mwah. Oh. Okay, so uh, that was just a side note. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I Victor Hugo 
I've yet to read any of his stuff. I have Hunchback. I have a good I, oh, I have it too. I'm looking at it on my bookshelf right now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have Les Mis. <laughs> I thought about buying Les Mis, and that book is very, very long. And I tried to read Hunchback, and the first part is describing the building. And I'm like, mm, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh I never read Hamlet either. The only I I read Macbeth in high school, and I've always liked Macbeth. It's like the only Shakespeare play I really enjoy. I watch all the different film versions of it I can find. Uh, I've always thought Romeo and Juliet was overrated. Uh, it's not even that good of a love story. No, it's a lust story that got like five people killed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Also, the Greeks already did it, so haha, he he took it for I don't remember which like Greek tragedy it is but there's a greek tragedy that's just like that yeah the only people telling original stories were the greeks everything else is ripped off from them unless they took it from other people yeah but they didn't write that down that's true they didn't write that we have no proof (laughs) (laughs) um pocahontas was released in 1995 after a five-year development which is crazy for an animated film uh, that's not claymation. It was originally pitched by director Mike Gabriel, who this was his pitch. He went to Disney, went to the board of directors, slapped the title Walt Disney's Pocahontas atop an image of the character Tiger Lily from Peter Pan. He was like, this, this is what he, we want to do. He did not do that. He did that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Peter Pan is not the best film to use to pitch your sensitive native american movie what make red man red bro oh boy. I, I haven't seen peter pan in a very long time because i i loved it as a kid and i just ignored all of that i watched it when i was like 16 and i was like what the hell yo even as a kid i was like mm. <laughs> i was like i feel like this is not they're not even red i don't like this <laughs> Oh. But I did really like the movie. Yeah, Peter Pan was one of my... I had a handful of, of Disney movies on tape that I would just kind of cycle through as a kid. And Peter Pan was one of those films. So was Hunchback, Lion King. Pocahontas was not. I watched this much later in life, hence my disdain. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Mike Gabriel went up there with a Tiger Lily picture. and was like, how about we call this Pocahontas? And everyone was like, brilliant! Um. At the meeting with Disney's executives, uh, Gabriel's pitch ended up getting merged with an animated Romeo and Juliet adaptation Disney was developing. Sort of like, we want a romance. Pocahontas is sketchy when it comes to romance, if you know the story. So why don't we just shove Romeo and Juliet in there and make it natives versus the English and turn it into a love story? And nobody at Disney pushed back on that. (laughs) Uh. Basically, Disney chairman Jeffrey Katzenberg wanted another romantic film after Beauty and the Beast because that became the first animated film to be nominated for Best Picture at the 1992 Oscars. So that's what Katzenberg wanted, another Beauty and the Beast, as you mentioned. He wanted he wanted an Oscar. He wanted a Best Picture Oscar. And he never got one. Rip. <laughs> at the time, Aladdin and The Lion King were too far into development to be workshopped. So they were going to just take whatever they had working and turn it into a Romeo and Juliet style movie. But Aladdin and the Lion King had been too far animated. So they're like, all right, we can't do that. Pocahontas is about to enter the storyboard phase. So let's do it with that. It was retooled into a romantic drama. The character of Pocahontas was made older. The animals were turned mute. Usually the animals could talk in a Disney movie. But this time they were like, no distractions. Not this one. No talking for you, Miko. Mm-mm. <laughs> they were going to have Jim Carrey voice the dog. No. Yeah. That's why it has those weird facial contortions. That makes sense. Yep. Percy, I believe, right? Who is named after a real person. <laughs> the first the first governor of the colony was Percy, William Percy. And that's who they <laughs> gave the dog name to. <laughs> what a legacy. <laughs> You're a dog. Uh, so the film's villain, Governor John Ratcliffe was a hybridization of actual English captains, particularly John Martin, Christopher Newport, and Edward Maria Wingfield. 
They kept the name Ratcliffe entirely because it sounded sinister. They didn't give a shit about the character <laughs> history. They were just like, Ratcliffe sounds evil. Let's keep that. Like, perfect. <laughs> that was a real guy, right? Yeah, we could put our history in there. Poof. Yeah. John Ratcliffe was a real Jamestown settler. Mm-hmm. And his story is fucking horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little spooky. Yeah. So we're going to, um, this is what happened to John Ratcliffe in 1610. Um. The starving time in Jamestown when Jamestown didn't quite work out and almost everybody died. 25 colonists were invited to a gathering with a large group of Powhatan Indians. The Englishmen were promised they would be given corn in return for copper. It was a trap. The colonists were given food baskets that were empty. The Powhatans ambushed them. Ratcliffe was taken to the village. He was tied to a stake in front of a fire. Women then skinned him alive with muscle shells, tossed the pieces into the flame as he watched. They skinned his face last and finally burned him at the stake. That is some Eli Roth horror movie shit. That's some pretty tasty stuff right there. Um, That just goes to show so many people have like that stereotype of like, oh, Native Americans were like peace loving hippies that just wanted like, uh, (laughs) have you read a history book? Like. They were yeah, fighting off it, an invasion. Like they were yeah, like, man, like they're, you're not just going to, Oh, Hey friends, here's a flower crown. Would you like food? Like, uh, no. And they did that to each other too. Like they're like any other people in history. They just had different circumstances and different technology. Like <laughs> the entire <laughs> his, like history of mankind can be summed up with the phrase people suck. Yeah. People suck. And the way that we've progressed through time is finding new ways to kill each other. That's where we get all of our technology from. Like, oh, like, wow, we have nuclear power to power our houses and stuff. How how cool. Why did we develop that? Because we wanted to blow an entire city out of existence. Like, why not? Like, Yeah, and we're getting a movie about that in July. See? There's stuff <laughs> like that. Like, oh, why did we go in space so we could spy on the Russians? Like, <laughs> we wanted to beat them. It's literally all just about warfare. Whether or not it's hot or cold, like, that's how we get all of our technology is because we want to make sure we can kill humans more efficiently. And then eventually we're like, oh, that's outdated. So we'll use it for something good now. Anyway, now to this new invention. Like, <laughs> That's a very cynical and bleak way of looking at history, but it's pretty true. It's pretty I mean, accurate. it's true. I told my kids that when I was teaching them. I was like, y'all want to know why all this stuff happens? I said, we just want to find creative ways to kill each other. And then we use that technology for good. That's why our swords were super sharp. We needed a better metal to kill people. These rocks aren't working anymore. So we got to get metal. Oh, and metal, I guess, can also be used for like pots and pans and like, you know, houses and stuff. But first and foremost, I can put it in a gun and shoot someone or I can make it really sharp and stab like perfect. Have you seen School of Rock? Yes. It's been a while, but yes. You telling the your students about how bleak history is it reminds me of jack black telling them about the man just like, you know the world is run by the man like yeah it's it's it sucks but you know films like this go a long way towards kind of poisoning the well when it comes to historical accuracy and knowledge and you know whitewashing and rewriting history like films do that not all films but a good chunk of them yeah well, because, like, nobody wants to go to a movie. Like, okay, like, imagine if this story was really what happened. People aren't going to want to go watch that. They're not going to want to go and watch Pocahontas when she's, like, 11 and has her head shaved and she's naked running around because they didn't wear that many clothes and they were kids. And, then, like, John Smith isn't, like, a sexy blonde man. He has, like, a beard and, like, fought in, like, Constantinople and stuff like that. And then, like... You know, like he he goes and he's like telling his people you're either going to work or starve. And they're like eating each other in the colony because they don't have food anymore. And like nobody, nobody wants to watch that as a Disney movie. Like you don't you want to watch. Oh, like look at this. Oh, it's forbidden love. Ooh, spooky. Look how beautiful this lady is. She's so tall. She's got like that cool like arm tattoo that I always wanted as a kid. Like, she, oh, wow. Look at the turquoise, which I don't even think they had turquoise out in the East. Um, So that would have been like traded, I guess. Um, But yeah, like <laughs> nobody wants to watch the real thing. That's why you make it fun. But, you know, you also ruin a lot of people's perceptions because most people won't go and actually look at what happened they'll just accept the movie as fact because they're like disney's never steered me wrong before so yeah of course what they said is right and then 
than your history teachers yelling at you when you're in the eighth grade telling you that no Pocahontas was not an 18 plus year old woman <laughs> when John Smith got there. No, they did not fall in love. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> but when you that make, me. sorry, when you... I, I had a, <laughs> I had a feeling that, that, that felt like it came from a real place. <laughs> Miss Howell, man, shout out. She's the best history teacher I ever had. And she was all like, I hate that movie. Like, <laughs> And then Dewberry in high school hated Anastasia. And that's another animated film we could do. Oh, boy, that. Why do they keep making animated like romantic adventures out of real life, like horrific tragedies? Like the, the death of the Romanovs and the, the invasion of the new world. Like, holy shit. Like, what's Netflix... next? Romeo and Juliet during the Holocaust? like produced by disney oh god probably i guarantee you that probably exists somewhere um there's a netflix series right now it's called i think the the princess and the conqueror it's a spanish one and it's a native american woman falls in love with the conquistador oh my god <laughs> and i wanted to watch it. Me? i wanted to watch it for the shits and giggles but i'm like i can't like i'm trying to learn spanish i'm not gonna i'm not gonna learn spanish on this show <laughs> Jesus, they're gonna re- they're gonna revoke my my history degree. <laughs> Sorry, you can't have this anymore. Yeah, you just start. You do your whole thesis on the romance between the natives and the conquistadors. They're like, we we got to see, we got to talk to you. Like, hold on, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> oh my god! See, that's the problem, though. Like, there are people who are like doing history projects on you know films, and they're like. And this is how Pocahontas, you know, helped negotiate a truce. It's like, what which, truce? okay, there is there is some factual stuff to that, which I have um, information, but like, yeah, there wasn't you know, the, the movie makes it look like it's like a final, like, and now everything went smoothly and everything is happy. Yay! That's why you see so many Native Americans in the in the eastern part of the United States now. Smile. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't that doesn't come up. They've yet to do, you know, Disney on the reservation. That has not happened. Disney Trail of Tears. God. (laughs) I'm honestly, you know what? It's probably been pitched. Probably. All this shit's been pitched. It's uh, they could make it like a Moses movie. They fucking might. Think I don't know. As long as you know, Ice Princesses are selling billion dollar films, (laughs) maybe we'll stay in that lane for a while. (laughs) I'm okay with that because that's not real. It annoys me, but I'm like, go for it. Like, little kids like it. Good for you. I like so many stupid things when I was a kid and still like stupid things today. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I do, too. To an extent. <laughs> uh, the original script featured a character named Red Feather, who was a wise cracking turkey. He was going to be voiced by John Candy. Mm. Yeah. Then Candy died. Oh. The character was scrapped completely as they realized he greatly clashed with the film's tone, which critics said was pretty much all over the place. Like, what are we supposed to feel here? And I'm like, you know what? You're right on that. <laughs> um, in a surprisingly progressive move for Disney, all the prominent Native characters are voiced by actual Native actors, uh, particularly Pocahontas and her father, Powhatan. Pocahontas is voiced by Alaskan actress Irene Bedard, and Powhatan is voiced by Russell Means, who is Oglala and Lakota Sioux. So he's That's also cool. he also ran for president under the the uh, libertarian banner. He's a bit of a interesting character. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't realize that they were voiced by native like native people. That's actually that's that's cool to hear that. Um, because her I think her singing voice is different though. It is. Yeah, it's it a is. It's it, is it Jody something? Mm, let me see real quick. Um, Pocahontas voice uh, singer is Judy Kuhn. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that's what pops up on the album whenever I play it. Mel Gibson still pops up for his, though. So according he, to that, he sings it. He did. He sounded like he did. I told my mom that, and she was like, no, he didn't sing it. I was like, that sounds like Mel Gibson. Like, unless I got a really good, like, voice-alike person, I'm like, we're sure that's Mel Gibson. Yeah, it was him. He didn't care for that. <laughs> he, um, he was, yeah, Mel Gibson joined the cast as John Smith, mostly because he, quote, wanted to make something for his kids. Apparently, that's kind of cute, though. 
these kids didn't watch Mad Max. <laughs> they didn't like the Passion of the Christ. That didn't happen yet, but probably not. I also <laughs> didn't realize he wasn't in it. I always thought he like was Jesus in the movie. So I was like, oh, man, I'm not excited about watching a movie with Mel Gibson voicing Jesus. Like, oh, no, he wasn't even. In- oh, OK. It made the movie a lot better to me. I'm not even Catholic, but I would have problems with an Australian Christ. <laughs> yeah, I really like the movie just because like everybody spoke in like the, the language at the time, which was pretty sick. Yeah, I find it kind of crazy that the guy who played Jesus got struck by lightning on the set of that movie. Almost like, hmm. yeah, I would. They're working on a sequel right now. Yeah, like, it's about the resurrection. I'm about to say, I was like, I, I hope, I hope that's what it's going to be about. <laughs> yeah, there's only one way to sequelize that story. <laughs> I don't know. You could do a fake thing, and you know, Jesus. Co- it's like the um, he's not crucifying around meme that's on. Um, I think what was it? Is it Rick and Morty? <laughs> I don't remember what it is. I don't know, but that is fucking great. <laughs> Yeah, Jesus is back and he's not crucifying around. Like they they did that on Family Guy where they like they found Mel Gibson's secret screening room and there was yeah, a trailer yeah. for Passion Two crucified. That was probably those. it. That was probably it. I don't even remember, but but he who is without sin kick the first ass. That was that was from that. <laughs> yeah. So Mel's doing that. Uh, this was the same year as Braveheart, so he had a big ninety five. Oh. Another yeah. very accurate movie. That's going to be probably our 50th or some big milestone because that movie is notorious or it's just complete ignoring of Scottish history. What are you talking about? I went to Scotland and we were driving to Loch Ness on a tour bus and this person pointed out a statue of William Wallace is like somewhere on the on the hills. And he immediately went into this tirade of how much the Scots hate Braveheart. Unprompted. It was hilarious. Like, speak it off. We hate that Braveheart film. It's a piece of <laughs> shit. He didn't even ask us. Like it was. Oh, it was great. <laughs> I can't wait. Let's, to do it's part. good. It wasn't because someone brought it up. Like, oh, like the Mel Gibson. They have a statue of Mel Gibson here. Like, no, <laughs> they do not. <laughs> there is this. There is a, a a town in in Scotland. I think it's the town Wallace is from. Where they built a statue of Wallace, but they modeled him after Mel Gibson. So there's a statue of Mel Gibson in this small Scottish town. That's gross. I was happy. I've been to Jamestown. I don't know if you've been to Jamestown. I feel like you said you have, right? I've been to Williamsburg, but I haven't been to Yeah. Okay. Well, I went to Jamestown, and I was very glad that they don't have a statue of John Smith from Pocahontas, and that it is a statue of John Smith, John Smith, with, like, the pointy beard and stuff. Like, (laughs) Thank God for that. My family actually did burn it down, though. Oh. I'm related to one of the men who followed Nathaniel Bacon. Nice. Yeah, the Bacon's Rebellion. Woo. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, John or Jim Bridger. Nice. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. That's my claim to fame. I'm a son of the American Revolution. I'm apparently related to Pocahontas in some way because of her son, Thomas. Um, But I think like with most people, you can trace your ancestry to those you know like big names because like those are the people that survived which is why there's so many people that are like i'm related to this famous guy like yeah because they survived (laughs) i found it i'm related to one of uh, edward the first bastards Ooh, that's kind of cool longshanks (laughs) what you're related oh no wait yeah he is longshanks i'm about to say i'm stupid sorry yeah like that is pretty cool though yeah i like braveheart not just because of that but i think it's a good movie hammer of the scots (laughs) Also, I think Enya sings some of the songs in that movie. Which that sounds right. Enya. Yeah, Enya's Enya's nice. Yeah, Braveheart will be fun. Um, a young Christian Bale voices Thomas. <laughs> he does. The young upstart who <laughs> kills uh, Koakum. And uh, yeah, he's like 18, 19. I don't know. Like maybe maybe a little older than that. But um, yeah, it's very it's weird hearing Christian Bale be so like young and optimistic like we're gonna we're gonna find gold aren't we john it's so adorable and, and then i'm gonna years... kill coco um yep <laughs> and five years later you're gonna be patrick bateman Woo! <laughs> i watched that recently for the first time in a long time american psycho and oh, I, I love that movie i didn't i didn't like it no I... that's my comfort film connor you what? have to like every movie that i like <laughs> i 
I liked him. I thought Bale did a great job. He was a despicable, weird guy. I just, the movie didn't really make any sense. You like Huey Lewis in the news? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that was, that was fun. That was a fun watch. Just watching him kill people. But ultimately, I was like, I, I'm, I'm enjoying his performance, but like, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> Where did Willem Dafoe go? <laughs> <laughs> He's gone. Oh, here's a funny story about Pocahontas. The movie, not the character, not the <laughs> real person. Like... Not a lot of funny stories about the real story. Um, in the 90s, two movies were being made at the same time. Mm-hmm. And most of Disney's best animators were put to work on Pocahontas, as the higher-ups believed it to be the more prestigious and likely successful film, as opposed to the other Disney film that was being worked on, which was seen as more of a B-picture, if it makes money, great. That movie was The Lion King. And it was Disney's biggest success of the 90s, grossing nearly a billion worldwide. Yeah. And that was made by Disney's B team, who were mostly like the Disney Channel guys, who were a lot of them were animating animals for the first time. (laughs) I think this is how a giraffe moves. (laughs) Yeah, And it outshined Pocahontas big time. Dang. (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, Pocahontas was a was a decent hit in its own right. Grossed three hundred and forty-six million on a budget of only fifty-five million, so you know, pretty good. Has an IMDb score of six point seven, letterbox score of three point two out of five, and a Rotten Tomato score of fifty-five percent. Hell, that's so, disgusting. <laughs> rotten Tomato. That's how much. That's how much Babylon got. <laughs> British consensus reads: Pocahontas means well and has moments of startling beauty. But it's largely a bland, uninspired effort with uneven plotting and an unfortunate lack of fun. Ah, piss off. (laughs) I got to give it the lack of fun. I mean, kids kids are going to be bored. I do think, yeah, I think there's some of the, well, today's kids, 90s kids. We, we got the, you know, we got whatever we could get. Hey, I had a toy wigwam and Pocahontas dolls growing up. So shut up. I had fun. <laughs> I have a Pocahontas Pez dispenser. Hey, that's kind of cool. From the Disney Princess line. Oh, wow. Mulan is in there, too. And I'm like, she's not royalty. She's not a princess. Like, no. if she would have married the emperor, okay. She didn't. <laughs> yeah, just because it's a female character in a Disney movie does not make her a princess. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's for another time. Yeah. We don't know that Mulan really happened. <laughs> uh, Pocahontas won two Oscars, but it was, you know, they weren't the Oscars that Katzenberg was aiming for. This did not get nominated for Best Picture. And if it had, it would have lost to Braveheart. It won uh, Best Original Score and Best Original Song for Colors of the Wind, which both went to Alan Menken and Stephen Schwartz. Hell yeah, Alan Menken is great. That dude, that guy was the shining star of Disney for the 90s. Holy hell. All of them. It was was him. Except Tarzan. I think that was mostly Phil Collins. But, oh, hell yeah. Yeah. The rest of them, it was it was Mankin. I think he won like five Oscars in the 90s. There was one direct-to-video sequel, 1998's Pocahontas 2, Journey to a New World. Mm-hmm. Follows Pocahontas as she travels to England after hearing news of John Smith's death. It's horribly received by critics, and I hope to do it on this show one day because I'm sure it's going to be even worse in historical accuracy than this one. I've never seen it because I hate Disney's direct-to-video films, except for Cinderella 3. Cinderella 3, A Twist in Time, mwah, it's a fantastic movie. Um, all of the other ones, shit, because they I- don't have a good animation team. The voices usually aren't the same. Um, except for some, I think she reprised her role. Like I think you just said that she did. I don't remember if you just said that, but she, oh. the the voice actress reprised her role in that one. Um, and Ratcliffe is in that movie too. And I know she ends up marrying John Rolfe in that movie. So they're like, well, look, like they didn't actually look. They didn't get together. Like, why is everybody named John? Well, it's everybody. like how in the Tudor era, everybody was Thomas. Ah. Thomas, 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 Thomas. I, I like living in an age where there's more names. Yeah. 
or we don't feel like we have to name our children after like historical figures. Like I'm going to name you George because of our first president. Like, are you telling me you're not going to name your firstborn son, Theodore? Uh, I don't want him to get bullied. So probably not. (laughs) I really have thought about it. I'm not near having children, but my Roosevelt husband, uh, you know, he needs a child to be named after him. Thought about it. <laughs> I figured. Speaking of direct to video sequels, I gotta say, I think the Aladdin sequels are pretty good movies. I never really liked Aladdin, so I've never seen them. Uh, but I've I guess yeah, I haven't heard bad things about them. I remember seeing the previews for them on my VHS tapes. <laughs> Return of Jafar is a fun, dark movie. Homer Simpson voices the genie, which is see really <laughs> yeah, Dan Castellaneta. Uh, and Iago becomes a good guy. He like turns on Jafar, and it's it's a, it's a pretty decent movie. And then the third one, Robin Williams came back as the genie, and it's about Aladdin finding out his father's still alive and is leading the forty thieves. Yeah, that's the one I remember because it was like the preview, and it was like my father's alive in the forty thieves. It was like the song, or whatever that was <laughs> yeah. like coming soon to own on VHS. <laughs> I had those on tape. I loved those movies. I got them on DVD now because I'm like, I need to own those movies. And the nostalgia. Yeah. Lion King 2 wasn't bad either. It was just, it was Romeo and Juliet. Like the first one's Hamlet, the second one's Romeo and Juliet. And then they did like a Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead side movie <laughs> called The Lion King One and a Half that nobody. Yeah, I remember saw. that. <laughs> ah, it's funny. Yeah. They're not, I, a lot of those are largely forgotten. But thanks to Disney Plus, you can watch all of them now. It's true. Thank God. I don't want to buy these anymore. Disney movies are expensive. They are. They're like a new video game. Like, oh God. Because they know that they're always on the bottom shelf. Mm-hmm. And kids will go like, oh, you know, mommy, mommy, Cinderella. And mom will just be like, fine. And spend 30 bucks on Cinderella. Not oh, fuck you, kid. <laughs> I'm going to read you the real Cinderella. We're going to cut her heel off to get in the shoe. And the stepsisters are going to have their eyes plucked out by crows as they go on their wedding. Jesus. Why is Disney doing this? Disney made everything adorable and cute. They have ruined our culture. We need to go back to scaring kids and being like, if you go outside at night, an evil witch will come and take you away and feed you to a cat. It's like, oh, and then the cat doesn't want to, the kid doesn't ever want to go outside. Walt That's Disney's how- Baba Yaga coming 2024. That's what the I end, want. By the end of it, she learns the true meaning of Christmas or something. <laughs> Disney, yeah. La Llorona. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> she adopts other kids that were killed and isn't actually a murderess. <laughs> That's the sequel to Coco. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Well, now that we talked about the movie, let's talk about Pocahontas. What happened to this poor girl? Quite a lot. Um, so Poca, I have some stuff here. Um, I'm interested to see what you've got. Okay. I got um, all my stuff from the National Park Service. Oh. Because well, I wanted to make sure, because I feel like this is a well enough known topic that anybody that's listening, if they heard something wrong, they bit wrong. So I want to make sure if anything I say is wrong, the National Park Service told me to say it. So go tell Smokey Bear that he's wrong. Um. (laughs) See, that's what I thought when I first started podcasting. First few filmgasms are like, I got to get my information right. I hope the years are correct. I'm 250, 60 something in now. And I'm like, I don't care. Yeah, the year's wrong. I'll talk about it next time. And then we'll talk about a different movie. Just be like, oops, anyway. (laughs) Like last night we did uh, Waiting on Beyond the Bad. And Caleb messed up a name. Yeah, he was talking about George Romero, and he said George Lopez. Nice. And we talked about it for a good bit, because I was like, did you just, like, you almost said George Lopez, didn't you? It's like, no. So, say whatever you want. Who cares? Yes. (laughs) Um, So, just some background info. Pocahontas was the favorite daughter of Powhatan. And this, what I got is from Smithsonian Magazine. Um. He ruled the 30-aught Algonquian-speaking tribes in and around the area of Jamestown. 
Uh, years later, John Smith would write about his adventures in the New World and talk about the beautiful daughter of a powerful Native leader who rescued him from being executed. And there might be some truth to that. Uh, apparently, scholars are starting to think he made this up, that he lifted it from a Scottish ballad, which is hilarious. He's like, what really happened wasn't that interesting, so why don't we give it a little flourish? Ah, I, I wish I could lie this easily. Well, I mean, back then, it's like you had fact check. Like, you couldn't just get on the internet and be like, mm, let me see if that actually happened. Like, no. Unless you were there. <laughs> and, like, yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, you could be on a ship and just be like, I saw a mermaid. And they'd be like, seems legit. I've yeah. never seen one, but he said he saw one. So, Yeah, that's why the fucking, you know, legend of the Kraken is still here. Because people are like, look at that giant octopus. Like, where? It was just there. You missed it. <laughs> <laughs> you just went underwater. <laughs> He flipped oh, you out like... before he went under. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, so Pocahontas, the big thing this movie does is adjust her age for uh, a less creepy love story. She was about 11 or 12 years old when this all went down. And John Smith was quite older than that. And uh, whether or not he fell in love or just straight up kidnapped this, this girl it was not a consensual relationship. Uh, when Jamestown was founded in 1607, Powhatan selected her for a special role because of her intelligence and personality. Captain John Smith said her, quote, wit and spirit made her stand out. Uh, he met Pocahontas when he was captured a few weeks after the first colonist arrived. He was brought before Powhatan. They were ready to beat the shit out of him. And she intervened and put her head on his head just like the movie the end of the movie and smith was like thank god for this girl <laughs> i like i'm alive because of her but modern scholars think she was probably playing a scripted role in some kind of adoption ceremony yeah yeah so but he wouldn't have known that it was an adoption ceremony like you know because it's not like you can speak their language so imagine you know being captured and then taken in front of like the chief and then having your head placed on stones and then having a warrior lift a club above your head i would also think i was about to die like yeah then they punked him i love that they're like you know april fools said, you're my son out. now <laughs> yeah and yeah they couldn't speak the language but in the movie they Learn that in about two seconds. Yeah, everybody speaks English. Yeah. Even the natives who've never met an Englishman mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. God. Ah. Um, so, if that, you know, Powhatan did this whole ceremony to adopt John Smith, possibly, uh, she began visiting Jamestown. Didn't just wander in. She always came with an, with an envoy of Powhatan's people. Her presence signaled that this was a peaceful arrival. She became just kind of the ambassador between Powhatan and the Englishman. They also learned that her name's not Pocahontas. It's not. That was a nickname. <laughs> that meant the playful one. Yeah. Mato Matoka. Mm -hmm. That's her name. And it'd be concealed for fear the English could do her harm if they knew it. Which is weird. It's like if they know her name, they're going to fuck her over. I mean, yeah, but it's like their, their culture. You know, that was That's her. True. I think she had two names. That was her. No, hold on. Where is it at? I had it somewhere. I wrote it down. I can't find it. Otherwise, oh, she had two names. She had one that like was just like her common name, and then she had yeah Matoaka, which was only used by her like family. So um, Amanute was her name, and then Matoaka was the one that like only like real close people could use. But yeah. they called her Pocahontas, the playful one. Um, and that name like stood true because apparently it was documented whenever she'd come to visit Jamestown, some of the kids should be like doing cartwheels with them and stuff. Which also, I bet, cute. you know, Disney said Pocahontas is the easier one to say. Let's call them. Oh, movie. heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine a movie titled Matoka. <laughs> Weirdly, okay. they did try to make this uh, this uh, Inuit movie called um. I think it was like a took or something like that. And every actor attached to it died. Ooh, hmm. It's weird. It was offered to John Belushi, who OD'd on drugs in the 80s. Rip it was then offered to Sam Kinison, who died in a car accident. Then John Candy, who died of a heart attack. Then Chris Farley, who also OD'd on drugs. And then they just stopped trying to make the movie. Maybe they shouldn't give it to like really obese people. 
well, the character is they were going to give it to Jack Black and then they decided to stop doing because they're like, we we might kill Jack Black. <laughs> we can't kill Jack Black. He's going to be Poe later on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. So during this period, Powhatan was getting tools and weapons for his colony in exchange for food, which Jamestown desperately needed. Mm hmm. Colonial leaders presented Powhatan with a newly arrived boy, 13-year-old Thomas Savage. It's a great name. Might be Savage. I feel like if it's from England, it's probably Savage. But what are the odds of that? <laughs> a guy named Savage. I think there is a like there is a big chance. Would show up to be an I just I it's well it's see it probably was pronounced Savage, but like a lot of English, they didn't want to use the French pronunciation for things anymore. They're like, we don't feast or we don't dine, we eat bitch, like <laughs> we don't do any of that. We hate the French. Ew, frogs, gross. That is true. All of that is happening while all of this is happening as <laughs> well. Uh so Thomas Savage. And uh, showed up. Powhatan gave a young man named Namantak in return. They exchanged boys. It's weird saying that. Uh, these were common in relationships in the region. They would, you know, learn each other's customs, learn each other's languages, be, serve as envoys in the future. And Pocahontas was there to help Thomas adjust to his new life. But Which, soon... as far oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Well, no, as far as I, I read, there was two other kids that were. Um, I don't want to say traded, but that were given to uh, Chief Powhatan as well. It wasn't just Thomas Savage. I don't know if you had that in your notes. Sorry, <laughs> I don't. But yeah, feel yeah, feel free. Yeah, well, there was like there was two other kids oh. that were also given to him. Uh, but you know, if you if you got it, you can keep going. I do. I do have them here. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, I <laughs> spoiled it. This is from Time Magazine's article on Pocahontas, and they they were very thorough. So thank you, Time. I'm stealing your content. <laughs> um, so, um, where was I? Powhatan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Englishmen started demanding more and more food. They were like, we we're hungry. Virginia was in a deep drought. Food was scarce. In the beginning of 1609, John Smith led a party to visit. Powhatan, things seem to be going pretty well. But then in the dead of night, Pocahontas went to go tell Smith that they're going to be all the Jamestown settlers are going to be killed. And Smith tried to reward her with, quote, such things as she delighted in. But she was sad and said, you know, if she's seen with English presence, she, they're going to kill her, too. <laughs> uh we don't know if this was her acting alone or if her father told her to go tell Smith, like, hey, shit's going to go down. Powhatan moved his capital farther west to a location where the English couldn't reach, or at least it was harder to reach. Pocahontas quit visiting the fort. Thomas Savage went with the Powhatans, was joined by another boy, 14-year-old Henry Spellman. Everything changed when they were at uh, Oropax, Powhatan's new capital. And uh, Henry went to... He went to join a friendlier chief on the Potomac. Pocahontas intervened to save his life when her father sent men to bring him back. And then he decided it's time for Pocahontas to marry. So she married Coacum, who we see as the jilted lover in the movie. Gets killed by Thomas. And uh, Coacum sent Thomas back to Jamestown, severing his last ties with the colony. At the end of 1612, Captain Samuel Argall was looking for food. This was just Find food and survive. There was no other goals here. As he entered the Potomac, he heard rumors of Pocahontas was up there, made his mind to possess myself of her by any stratagem that I could use. That is a terrifying thing to say. Uh, his plan was to ex exchange her for Englishmen held by Powhatan. And uh, he forced the Potawameks, who were the people Henry Spellman was sheltered with, to trick her into going onto his ship and sailed away with her. Mm-hmm. So 14-year-old Pocahontas returned to Jamestown as a prisoner. Jamestown's leaders soon discarded the plan of using her in a prisoner exchange, and now they saw her as the key to their success. So she's just a pawn in this great scheme of conquering. Damn shame. Um, yeah. Y'all yeah, good? No, it's um, I, that story. I was reading it last night, and the way that they did it, it wasn't just like, oh, we got you. It was his wife 
went up and was all like, hey, like, we have a really cool ship. Do you want to come see it? And she was all like, okay. And like, walked over to see the ship. She's like, wow, that's, that's a boat for sure. And she's like, you want to go inside? Like, no, I'm good. And the husband was like, well, my wife can't go inside unless you go inside. She's like, yeah, I still don't really want to go inside. This is kind of suspicious, bro. And then the wife started crying and she's like, okay, fine. I'll go inside. And then they ate food and they're like, ah, get got. We got you. You're captured. And it was like, ah, damn. And that's, that's how they did it. It was so much easier to trick people back then. <laughs> Just like, damn I'll it. cry if you don't look at my boat. Ah, uh, well, <laughs> I don't want you to cry, so I guess I'll go inside. Oh man, I was bamboozled. <laughs> I hope I don't know. I'm picturing her like being as nonchalant as you are right now about it, and it's just making me laugh. It's like, oh no, curses, ah, man, again. Darn. <laughs> ah. <laughs> So a young Puritan minister named Alexander Whitaker started to teach her about Christianity, as they did. And a man named John Rolfe began to fall in love with her. And this is part two. This is Pocahontas two. Sometime in the spring of 1614, Pocahontas Pocahontas renounced publicly her country, idolatry, openly confessed her Christian faith, and was baptized as she desired, which is horseshit. (laughs) No way she wasn't forced to do this. See, I don't want to like, I don't want to be like, it's possible, but I mean, it could be a possibility. Like there were some people that did choose to, you know, you can't assume that every single Native American was forced against their will to convert. True. But I think the one who was kidnapped by the English. And that's fair. No, it is. It is fair. It is fair. But still, you know, like, because Powhatan gave a blessing to the marriage. Would he have done that if she didn't want it? Wasn't she married to Coquim though? She was married to Coquim, however, comma, they did have a divorce like thing. Like they could get divorced. That was a thing. So like Coquim knew that if she's over there and she's with and this is again, this is all national park stuff. Um, <laughs> if she's over there with like John Rolfe and all that, like she's gonna leave me. And Powhatan gave her the blessing and even sent like her uncle as a representative of the people and himself to the wedding. And I feel like if it was something that was so forced, he wouldn't have done that, especially being his favorite daughter. You know, that was like the that was the part that I'm like, you always hear how horrible it was. But then I read that. I'm like, was it that bad? You know, I don't know. Well, it's just, Obviously, being kidnapped is awful. Like, that's awful. Like, that's horrible, horseshit, gross. Um, but like, is it not possible that she could have converted because she wanted to? Or was it Stockholm Syndrome? I just, I feel like when you're the only person who's not Christian and they're basically saying like, you're going to convert to who we are or bad things are going to happen. You don't really have a lot of options there. And I'm sure that I mean, Powhatan might've been like, I got to bless this or they're going to kill my daughter. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I wasn't there, but traditionally it has not been very uh, optional. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of times, at least like in the East or the East, the West, um, when people converted, it was like, there's food. <laughs> if I convert, y'all give me food. So that's cool. And also your God is apparently killing all my people. So maybe I do need to convert kind of a thing. Um, it's also interesting that they use Pocahontas as like a peace envoy, because that was another thing that was used in the West, um, which did we read that in Brown's class? Peace came in the form of the women or was that? I think that was an altar book. I think that was altar. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, for our for our people listening, um, that was like a common tactic by a lot of Native American tribes and European tribes. Whatever the like initial um, relationships were being formed, you know, you send a bunch of dudes to talk peace that have guns and swords and you know like spears. That doesn't look very peaceful. You send a woman and some children. They're probably not, you know, they're probably not there to fuck you up. Like, they're probably there to actually be like, hey, can you please stop burning down our crops? Like, we'll give you some more food if you, like, don't do that. Um, Which, that was interesting. It's also very interesting how much the Jamestown story parallels the Roanoke story, which was the first attempt of an English colony. Um, Because they had a very similar thing happen where they got there 
and they like had friendly relationships with the natives you know they were like they were changing or exchanging food all this all this stuff and then a drought came and these english soldiers who were not farmers were like i'm not a soldier i'm a farmer or i'm not a farmer i'm a soldier i'm not here to you know get food i'm here to like glory god and stuff like that no i'm not going to make food for myself just keep giving us stuff we'll keep giving you copper and the natives were like we can't eat copper no you don't get food anymore and they're like what do you mean we don't get food anymore and they get all angry and poof it explodes that's exactly what happened in roanoke um except roanoke just like died because you know they left and then they brought kids again for some reason <laughs> you know why not well there's a reason the kids and stuff went there they weren't supposed to go back to that place they were supposed to go further north but anyway <laughs> that's a whole thing yeah yeah well i think you know the reason jamestown's so similar is because we don't ever fucking learn no like this this time it'll work we'll just do exactly what we did the first time and it'll work this time that's perfect and this time if we run out of food we'll just eat each other because there was cannibalism at jamestown that was also not in the movie um i'd like to point that out I was a little disturbed at the Jamestown Museum. I have a problem with displaying dead bodies. Like, even if they're just, like, skeletons. I just, I don't like it. I wouldn't want my remains to be on display in a museum. Um, And that's, like, a thing they had there. They had a whole room of cannibal victims. And it was just, like, a bunch of skeletons of people who were clearly cannibalized. And it was, like, shit. That sucks. Like, you don't get to be buried in peace. You get to sit here in a box while people are like, ooh, look, this person got eaten. Like, ooh, it's crazy. Like, ugh. it's wild. But people don't think about that. Like, that also wasn't in the Disney movie because a little kid probably wouldn't want to see a person eating another person. I, I think they should do it. I want to see an R-rated Disney movie. I want them to yeah, just man. go ham on it and just give us what we want. Give us a Donner Party movie. Oh, man. <laughs> I don't think we've ever gotten a Donner Party movie. I don't know. I feel like you'd be a, you'd be a better source on that. I have no idea. They made a movie about the um the soccer team that crashed. Yeah, I know about that one. Yeah, alive, which I am planning to bring to this sooner than later. Uh, because Ethan Hawke plays one of the soccer players, and uh, no, he's he's a white American dude. Stop doing that. Um, but yeah, the whole envoy thing. If I was, you know, if I was a tribal leader in that time, I would. No, knowing the English are distrustful and are going to fuck me over eventually, I would train only my women and children to fight. It's fair. See, but at that point, this was only really the second English, yeah. like, you know, not the second, like they had had other, but this was like not, you know, they hadn't been coming to the new world that often. And of course, like news travels. So they already were kind of like, because that's another thing. A lot of people think whenever like the English arrived, the Native Americans were like, Oh, like I've never seen anybody like you before. No, they had seen people like them before. They hadn't interacted that we documented. You know, we didn't have any of that. But like they had known of their presence because the trade networks were huge. And, you know, the conquistadors got to Mexico in what, 15, 1519, I think is whenever uh, Cortez like destroyed Tenochtitlan. And like they were already in the American, the current American Southwest. And, you know, you travel and you trade and you see the Spanish ships off the horizon. So this wasn't like a, oh, like, what is this big, this floating clouds? What is this? Like, they they would have had an idea. Um, but yeah, like you wouldn't have necessarily known that they were going to be that distrustful, uh, which is also funny. Back to the Roanoke thing. So John Smith, part of his reason for being there was to try and find the Roanoke colonists. That was like part of their reason because it had only happened 1607. It was only like less than 10 years prior that that had happened. So that was part of their reason for being there was like, okay, like what happened to our other English, our 100 and I think 16 men, women, and children? Like, where did they go? And he actually asked Powhatan about it, which might have been during that meeting whenever he had become like his son quote um and powhatan was all like oh yeah like we have seen people that look like you before like oh really like we're there yeah we killed him like oh <laughs> oh why is roanoke considered this great mystery if we <laughs> we know that like we know what happened well see we don't know what happened powhatan says that they killed him but we don't have proof that he did. We don't have any English bodies. We don't have any of that. There's no bodies that have been uncovered. That's why it's a mystery quote, because we have yet to find like, yep, here they are. Like they haven't found bodies of English men. And, and it's usually the women they're looking for. If they find an English woman that's dated before 1600. They found the group, but 
they haven't found that yet because Powhatan like presented him, I think with like a sword and some other stuff, but he could have gotten that trading, you know, because they did trade the Roanoke people when they were there, they did trade with the Algonquian speaking tribes. Um, but we don't know. And then there's also evidence that they went down to Croatoan Island, which is on Cape Hatteras. And that's why they left Croatoan written in the tree, which is usually where the history book stops. And they're like, anyway, going forward. Um, and there's evidence of blue eyed native Americans, I think there, which is yeah. like a thing, but we've yet to find like, that's where they were. And that's why it's like the mystery. I always told people when I worked at that national park this past summer, anything we're looking for is probably in the water because the island has gotten like way smaller and has moved since then because of, you know, just like ocean tides and currents and stuff. So everything that like we're looking for, probably in the ocean. That's very insightful and actually clears up a lot of questions I've had about that. Yeah. And that's the same thing. Jamestown would have been another Roanoke. Um, but it was, I think, I don't remember exactly what it was. Um, again, you can look it up on the National Park website. They do a really good job interpreting this stuff. But there, um, it wasn't an island. It's an island today. But back then it wasn't an island. It was a part of like the actual, you know, inland of Virginia or modern day Virginia. Um but it's an island today because, you know, the river that's out there and then the ocean, the bay and all that stuff is constantly changing the shorelines. And Jamestown was like, they thought they hadn't found it. And they were like, it's in the water at this point. Like, it's not there. But someone was like, no, it's not. Like, it's right here and we need to dig now. Otherwise, it's going to be in the water. And they're like, no, it's not. And then they dug like, oh, shit, it is. <laughs> like, oh, God. So they wouldn't have found it had that person not been like, I promise you, like, it's here. It's not in the, like, it hasn't done Roanoke yet, but it's about to. <laughs> so we got to dig like, now <laughs> which is really interesting like they they found a lot which is cool one of the old buildings is still there um they know where a lot of the grave sites were where the wells are um it's very interesting yeah absolutely it's raining when i was there which kind of sucked <laughs> <laughs> i'd love to go there i'd love to check that out that'd be cool i know my uh my ancestor got like he was incredibly wealthy bridger and he joined bacon on an impulse and his family disowned him and that's why we are not incredibly wealthy landowners today. If things had gone correctly, like we would be one of the wealthiest families in the country. We don't own Virginia, basically. Rip. Yeah. So thanks, Bridger. You fucked us. <laughs> you piece of shit. <laughs> Standing up for your rights, damn it. <laughs> no, it was more like I want to kill natives and you're not letting me. So I'm going to do yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Your rights, bro. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Um, so Pocahontas is now Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, she basically, she changed her name to Rebecca mm -hmm. after she was baptized and became Rebecca Rolf when she married John. Uh, she sent a letter to Governor Thomas Dale stressing that her conversion was voluntary. But I feel like if you have to tell people like, no, it was me. I did. I did it. Believe me. That, that sounds coerced. Sounds a little suspicious, bro. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Rolfe was born her son the Virginia company decided to bring Pocahontas and her son to London to show off their success mm -hmm. they arrived in spring 1616 they were presented as visiting royalty she was, she was received at the royal court in an elaborate ceremony by the Bishop of London London being horrifically polluted in the 1600s uh, she got sick mm -hmm. they went ashore at Gravesend and she died at 20 okay. years old in March 1617. I thought it was 21. Oh, well, my source says 20, but I mean, it could be 20. Yeah, we don't we don't have an actual like birth date. So yeah, 20 to 21. She wasn't able to drink yet. <laughs> that That is a hell of a perspective. Is like she was an envoy to between the English and the natives. She was forced into Christianity, most likely. She was married. She had a kid. But she couldn't drink by today's standards. Yeah, by today's standards, she couldn't drink. She'd still be in college. God. If she went to college. Oh, man. Uh, baby Thomas was also sick. John left him to be brought up by his brother in Norfolk for fear he would not survive the ocean journey. And I don't it's, know what happened to move. baby. Yeah. Well, he survived because I'm apparently related to him. There you go. There you go. That's that's good news. Uh, that's the story of Pocahontas, pretty much. Um not exactly a Disney movie. <laughs> no. No. Not Is there anything I left out that you that you've got? No, I think that was pretty much it. Um it's just interesting. Like I think one of the things that they did like 
got right in the movie is the song mine 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 specifically john smith's like da 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 you know where he's all like all my life i searched for land like this one that one i'm not gonna sing it because you said that disney would defund us um but anyway <laughs> That is kind of like, I feel like that's kind of inaccurate because John Smith was very much an adventurer and explorer. He really wanted to be famous. He wanted to be like Cortez. Um, he never got married, which is very interesting to note. Um, he also fought out in the East and was captured in, um, I don't know if they were the, I don't know if it was the Byzantines. No, they wouldn't have been the Byzantines anymore. Um, what country would that have been? I don't know, wherever Constantinople would have been at that point, or Istanbul at that point. I don't think modern day Turkey existed yet. The Ottomans? Yeah, Ottomans. Um, yeah. yeah, he would have been, he was captured by the Ottomans. He fought out there like several times and apparently was given as a gift to like a very wealthy lady. So there could actually be John Smith babies out there. Um, we just don't know about them because it wouldn't have been legitimate. Um, and then, yeah, so then he came here to the New World. Um, he was known for telling people during the starving time, if you don't work, you don't eat. We're not going to feed you. So you have to work to eat, which I think is a good, that's, I think that's a very fair thing to say. Um, they really sold the shit out of the shirts at Jamestown. Like hardcore, like those who do not work, don't eat. And you see like really like lazy ass looking people buying them. Like, Hmm, that's ironic like but yeah um he wasn't that like charismatic of a person from what i i've read he wasn't like you know mel gibson like oh yes like look i'm a, I'm a piece no like homie was very just i mean i'm in it for me i'm trying to be you know glorious and i think he helped map a lot of the american east um he went on to do a lot of expeditions and mapped a lot of the rivers out there which is pretty cool i hope somewhere in modern day turkey there's like a Persian dude walking around with blonde hair and an Australian accent. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, in, um, what's it called? King of the Hill. When Hank finds out he has a Japanese brother who looks just like him, but <laughs> is Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> or like in Family Guy, Quagmire has a Spanish son. <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. So a couple couple more notes about the movie I just wanted to bring up. Um, so in the movie, uh, Smith gets wounded, mm -hmm. goes back to England. Pocahontas decides to stay with her people. That didn't happen. Well, he did get wounded and went back to England. Oh, never mind. <laughs> yeah, he had like a gunpowder wound, I think is what they said. And in 1609, he went back. I think is the year. Um, but whenever he went back, they told Powhatan and Pocahontas that he died. So in the second movie, when she's like, I thought you were dead. Like, that's legit what happened. But it wasn't like, I thought you were dead. So I married this guy instead. Like, no, that's not, that's not why. Um, but yeah, she legit, she thought he was dead. Um, and then whenever she actually went back, she saw him again in England and like, was very not like mean but like she reprimanded him and was like why were you such an ass to my dad like he was nice to you he treated you well and you did this and he was just like yo like it's a lot more complicated She's like no it's not bitch like it's not more complicated than that you were mean i hope when they when they ran into each other it was like that scene and it's always sunny when mac and charlie like connect <laughs> the restaurant and just like... i can't stop staring at him bro <laughs> Uh, that's wild. Uh, you'd think that, like, were the were, how come Powhatan couldn't like help with the wound? Why did they have to send him back to England? I mean, it could have been something that was just deep enough that it was like, yeah, our the Native American medicine isn't going to do anything for it. Like, we we got to send him back over there. Or he could have, you know, they could have helped it, but he wasn't going to recover in the climate. He had to go back because England's climate versus Virginia very different. Um, that's why a lot of the the English people got sick whenever they came to the New World, actually, because people don't realize that either. You know, you always know they brought diseases here, but there were diseases here that the native that the that the English like weren't used to. Um and there was, you know, just the climate and the bugs and all that stuff. Like they weren't, you know, England's very like cold and dreary and you know i don't think as humid as virginia because virginia and north carolina humid as hell if anybody is from houston it's like that except times 20 um it sucks i did not enjoy that so i don't know why they couldn't have done it i'm sure because at that point in 1609 the relationships were like starting to strain um because that was the starving time and it's like mm, we're also hungry 
no, like we're not we're not gonna give you anything. I wonder but, if like was he that badly wounded? I wonder if it was maybe just like this is my excuse to get the hell out of here. Maybe I don't know, but again, like I I did read that he was in fact wounded. Um, it wasn't like oh I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep Powhatan from getting killed, and then he like jumps in front of him like no, that's not what happened. Also, Ratcliffe wouldn't have been alive to do that anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he got skinned alive. Yeah, he was he was a pile of ashes. Yeah, God. that's still that's so unnerving. It's bananas. Ugh. Um, and this film, I gotta say, this film's biggest strength is Colors of the Wind. That is a beautiful song. It really is, and it's beautifully animated. I just I love all the songs in the movie. Um, but again, a lot of it for me is nostalgia. I do understand the songs are not as memorable. Like Steady as the Beating Drum. Can you sing that song right now? I can, but can you? Probably not. Any of the listeners? Probably not. Anytime, though, I do go canoeing, I do sing Just Around the River Bend. Not even going to lie. Anytime. Anytime I do it. <laughs> that's that's great. But, I, you know, I've got the same I've got the same feelings towards The Lion King that you have towards Pocahontas. Like, that's my, you know, saw it as a kid, know all the songs by heart movie. So I get it. I can't make it two seconds into Circle of Life without crying a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, and for me, it's like similar to you. I didn't, I didn't watch Lion King as a kid. We never watched Aladdin. We never watched Lion King. So the first time I ever saw those, I was like a, a, a late teenager, I guess. So I was like, meh, boring, <laughs> not that good. Like, ah, I, I was annoyed by like the goofiness of like Timon and Pumbaa. I didn't think it was funny, as I'm sure I would have if I were a kid. And then you know that stays with you when you're older. Like as a kid, I thought Miko and Flick were adorable, and I was like, oh, like they don't, they're so cute. Like look at Miko being crazy and person, the little shenanigans they get into. Like ah, look at that. <laughs> but you see it as a as a teenager and adult, you're like, this is dumb. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, fair enough. Um. That's really, yeah, that's all I got. Uh, anything you want to add? No, I think that was it. Like, we we covered everything that I got. If anybody has anything that they want to add, you know, tell us. Because um, I like hearing people's history knowledge. I like to build up my own. Also, yeah. the only other thing, I don't know if corn would have actually been yellow when they were when they were doing it. I was trying to look that up before this because I know there is yellow corn, but I don't know if the corn they would have had would have all been yellow. Like I know there's, you know, pretty colored corn and all that. I don't know. But that's their gold. Uh, Ah. Well that's just for the kids to be like, I that's corn. I know what corn looks like. Yeah, so they can laugh like that's not gold. That's corn. Ha 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 (laughs) that's what oh boy. So after weighing the evidence, it's a fake. It's a big, fat fake. (laughs) Absolutely. It is a fake movie, but I love it nonetheless. Fair enough. I I, I don't. (laughs) I think this is straight up white American propaganda. An attempt to whitewash this country's troubled history with native tribes. Repaint Pocahontas' story as an American legend, as it says on the poster. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) which is weird. Like, if they were going to do that, they should have done Sacagawea, a.k.a. Sacagawea. Like, they should have done that. Yeah, but again, harder to say than Pocahontas. We could watch Almost Heroes. That's a fun one. <laughs> I've never seen Almost Heroes, but I've, I've wanted to. It's a good movie. I'm a big Chris Farley fan. It's. A, I really enjoyed that movie. <laughs> I'm surprised they never made a movie about the Lewis and Clark expedition. I'm also related to Meriwether Lewis, apparently. Right I don't know how much this my grandmother makes up, but I like to believe her. It makes me feel better about myself. <laughs> uh, I think I'm related to Charlemagne. Ooh, that's pretty cool. It's pretty sweet. Charles the Great, the first Holy Roman Emperor. <laughs> he could not read or write, <laughs> which is very sad. There's like notes in history that he like would practice writing on a little tablet at night, but he could never do it. I'm like, that makes you really sad that like an adult man can't write, even though that was common back then. But it's like he was trying and he couldn't do it. <laughs> when you're king, you can get people to write for you. You don't That's have true. to read shit. <laughs> well, he started the Carolinian, I think. Dy- I think he was a Carolinian or Carolingian. Um dynasty and they like emphasized education because if you look at merovingian which is right before carolinian um they're like handwriting gross awful you can't read anything but you look at you know carolinian 
beautiful. It's awesome. You can read it because he was like, education, I can't write. <laughs> Other people need to be able to write, which is kind of cool. Yeah. I'm glad that somebody was finally stepping up to that and being like, come on, we're looking, we're looking, we're looking rough out there. Come on, man. It's like the year, what, 800, I think is, I don't know, 600 something when he was king. <laughs> oh, this was fun. This is, I think, our longest one yet. Heck yeah. Uh, oh, 700. For- I was close. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. If you like the show, feel free to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Filmgasm Productions. If you want to suggest films for us to check out, you can email us at filmgasm at gmail.com or send us a message through the socials. Uh, Check out our website, filmgasm.com, where we have reviews, articles, trailers of upcoming films at every episode of our shows. Uh, If you want to support the show through Anchor, you can click on support this podcast on your preferred provider. We appreciate any donations. Uh, quick reminder, Fake True Stories is not a weekly show, but rather a spontaneous experiment that can drop at any time whenever Isabel and I feel like putting one together. And when we do drop that next episode, it will be the 2006 basketball drama Glory Road. Woo, another Disney film. Yay. <laughs> Except this one is not animated and this one is based in my dad's hometown, El Paso, Texas. Um, basically, it's a it's a movie about the first um all black lineup in an NCAA basketball game when segregation or desegregation was going on. It was Texas Western, which is now UTEP versus the University of Kentucky, I believe, um, or the Kentucky Wildcats. Um, and it's basically how they got there and how big of a um, game changer it was to have, you know, different races on a basketball team, which is pretty cool. I really enjoyed it. Um, I don't know if it's accurate. I haven't seen the movie in years, but I love it. And I am excited to do it. This is probably the last sports movie I'm going to pick. Also, um, I didn't mean to do two in a row, but I really like Glory Road. So, Yeah, um, I'm always excited to learn new things. Uh, your last pick uh, was a happy surprise. I really enjoyed that one. So I think, you know, Glory Road, bring it on. Let's see this. Yeah. And uh, we'll explore you know, the desegregation of sports, which is an interesting topic pretty neat and then after that my next pick is death of stalin but that's like two episodes away so (laughs) i don't really know what i'm picking next but i'm gonna try to think of something really out the outside the box we might do a horror movie so i'm gonna yeah i oh actually you know what okay i do know what it's gonna be (laughs) all right all right i'm excited it's gonna be (laughs) be cool um don't miss dawn of the dead on wednesday's filmgasm plan nine from outer space on friday's beyond the bad and Akira Kurosawa's Ran on Oscar Sunday. Uh, in the meantime, uh, try not to whitewash any more Native American stories if you're in a position to do so. Please don't. And we'll see you next time on Fake True Stories. Bye.